are very privileged to have Megan Bamba doing us on cucurbits, otherwise known as squashes. Our cucurbits are a little bit special. We want to get over our Latin fears since we're doing this. So I'm talking about cucurbitaceae is the plant family. Um, and so these plants, this plant family is a little bit special. Let's see here. Yeah, um, because they're monoecious, which is a fancy way of saying they have separate female and male flowers. Um, so they're not like most of the other vegetables that we deal with, where they've got everything all in one package. They have two different packages. Um, and that's really important because it means that we can't just rely on the, or we, can, we can't just assume that they're going to just produce fruit on their own. They need that pollen to be transferred from one flower to the other, which is generally done with insects. Um, and this is important for us because when we're talking about preserving different varieties, um, because even though these insects are what cause us to get the fruit, they also are what cause different varieties to cross with each other. So it's a little bit more complicated with our squashes and cucumbers and melons because we can't just throw some netting onto our plants and say, it's okay, the bees aren't gonna get in here because we actually need the bees to get in there. Cucurbits are the genus Cucurbita, which does anyone know what this one is in common terms? Right, so these are our squashes. One, the other ones we're going to be dealing with, cucumis, which, anyone? Cucumbers, and what else is it? And melons. So they're the same genus. And then our last one is um, citrullus, which is watermelons. So Melons are actually more closely related to cucumbers than they are to watermelons, fun fact. Um, so we're gonna be dealing with four main species of cucurbita. Um, and then within, and most of our summer squashes are pepo, that's not entirely true, but most of the time. But they've also got some winter squashes too. So really there's no way to differentiate just visually which one of these species our squashes belong to. Um, except that the winter ones are generally going to be mostly these three, but sometimes they're pepo. Um, so it's really important to know which ones you have when you go in there to get your seeds um, and make sure you write it down. Um, with cucumis, we're basically just dealing with two. The cucumbers are sativus and the melons are mellow. So it helps with the word there. Unless you're getting an Armenian cucumber, in which case it's actually a melon. Also, fun fact. Um, and then citrullus, we're pretty much just dealing with one type. Um, so, going along with our not being afraid of Latin theme, um, this second one, this second word, so anytime we say the scientific name of our plants, we're going to say the genus name, which is capitalized, and then the species name, which is the second word, which is not capitalized. And this is that. That's the distinction that's most important for knowing which varieties are going to cross. So if you wanna grow a couple different types of squash, but you don't want them to cross with each other, you can pick a Maxima and a Pepo and you're gonna be fine. But you don't wanna pick two different Pepos, even if it's a pumpkin and a zucchini, and you think that's fine, I have two different types, but you don't have two different types, they think that they're the same. So how are we going to keep our plants isolated? Well, first of all, you personally cannot be growing two different varieties in your personal garden. Um, but then obviously if your next door neighbor has also squash growing, that's not going to work out too well either because we know that insects can travel significant distances. Now it's a little debatable as to whether or not we can kind of trust that insects won't travel that far in the city. Um, unfortunately it hasn't really been studied and is perhaps not very studyable. But, so for the sake of having all our bases covered, I'm gonna talk about the most labor intensive way to keep um, squashes and cucurbits isolated, but it's actually the most, the only 100% reliable way, since as I said, we can't physically isolate them. Unless you wanna set up an apiary under a giant net in your backyard, but you probably don't wanna do that. <laughs> um, so what we actually do then with cucurbits is hand pollinate them. 
but it's a lot easier than it sounds like, because it sounds like something really labor intensive. But we're going to demystify that so you all feel empowered to hand pollinate your squash um, and cucumbers and melons. So it's too bad that I don't have um, examples, but it's a little early in the season. But let's pretend that I'm a good artist, which I'm not. So let's pretend that these are beautiful images of squash flowers, <laughs> um, which look virtually identical, except that the female has the beginnings of a fruit, which is the ovary. So this is the female squash flower, and this is the male. So it's actually pretty easy to tell which one's which. With squashes, with your cucumbers and melons, it's going to be a little bit harder, but it's the same basic anatomy. Um, typically the male flower comes out first, so it'll, your first flowers to appear will typically be male, and then a couple of weeks later you'll get some female flowers, or a few days later, depending. Um, so staggering planting might help with that, but you know, I say go for it, see what happens. Um, I also find too, I don't know if this has happened to anyone else, but I was at one time last year not a very good plant parent to my squashes, and they never made female flowers at all. They only made male flowers. So just be mindful of that. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> so take good care of your plants, treat them well. Um, otherwise you might not get any seed at all. Um, so basically the first step is being able to identify which ones are male, which ones are female. Um, next, we need to catch these plants before they open. We all know that bees and other insects love squash flowers, so as soon as they're a little bit open, the bees are going to get there and contaminate our um, genetic supply there. So the best way to do this is to keep a very close eye on your plants. You will become intimately acquainted with every little movement um, and growth pattern of your plants as you're doing this. Um, and as soon as they look like they're about to open, which I can't really think of a good way to describe this, but when the flowers look as big as they're going to get um, and maybe are even starting to kind of pucker at the top a little bit, that's when you want to get your masking tape out. Or I'm thinking actually that blue painter's tape might work really well. Um, as long as it's sticky enough, let's say probably try a couple different things and see what works best for you. <laughs> um, and go out the night before your flowers are going to open and tape them shut. You're motioning something, David. Do you want to? Do you want to come be a squash flower? <laughs> so David's gonna demo to me. Of course, normally your squash flower won't be quite so hefty. <laughs> hey, I'm a good squash. Just like that, so that it doesn't open in the morning. So you want to do that with both male and female ones because you don't want either one of them to open. Um, that, that reasoning being, even with the males, that, so let's say your male plant opens, it has plenty of pollen to go around, but if the bee goes from one plant male to another, it's carrying that pollen back and forth, so you don't want other pollen in there. So you're going to tape all your flowers shut, come out the next morning bright and early, as we all love to do, um, but you've been intimately acquainted with your plants at this point, so you know when they're going to flower. And you're just going to go to the male plant first, and you can be actually less careful with the male plant because you don't want its blossoms anyway. Um, <laughs> and take those off. Um, at that point, you can actually remove all of the petals um, until you just have um, until you just have the anthers with the pollens on it exposed. Um, though actually, let's go back a couple steps. Um, you don't want to do that till you're right next to your female plant, ready to go, so you don't lose some of the pollen. So. Um, Take that over to your female blossom, do the same thing. Be much more careful with the female blossom because you still need those petals because you're actually going to re-tape it shut at the end. Um, so take your male flower, remove the petals. You've got a nice, now if you've done this correctly, you have a nice flower that's full of pollen all over it. If you open up your blossom and there's no pollen on there, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to try again until next time, then you've jumped the gun a little bit and um, you're not going to get anything out of this one. But most of the time, if you've, if you've chosen a flower that actually is fully mature, it's going to have pollen on it. Um, all I need to do at that point is just dab the pollen onto the, um, onto the stigma, which is the only place you can really dab it, so don't worry if you're not good on your um, botanical terms um, of your female flower. And you can actually just stick it right in there and then close the petals back up 
tape it up shut, and you're good to go. Um, a lot of people recommend actually using two different male flowers to pollinate one female flower because this kind of ups your chances, chances of it working. Um, you probably want to pick uh, male and female flowers from different plants, though some people will say that that's not necessary or maybe you actually want to pick them from the same plant because then you know they're more similar to each other. It's kind of open for debate. Um, you might not really have much of a choice. So one female fruit that becomes a fully mature squash or whatever obviously has a ton of seeds in it. However, you can't really guarantee that this is every time you hand pollinate is going to work. So I would do this as many times as you can, which brings me to my next thing, which is you should always carefully mark um, which plant. So I was on the stem underneath where the fruit is blossoming or is going to um, mature is the best place to put something. S seed extraction stage is the same as the edible stage. So we're talking about melons or winter squashes. You would pick them the same time that you would pick them to eat pretty much. Um, to be safe, you want to lean more towards the mature side, but for the most part, that's how you want to eat them as well. Um, with winter squashes, it's a good idea to pick them. And just in case we don't know this, winter squash, you want to make sure they get all the way hard and big and round, and also you're going to see that drying of the stem, um, which they say with watermelons as well. So that, that general same rule of thumb for picking it for eating. But then you actually get the best um, germination rates if you leave those squashes to sit and just sit out somewhere protected from the elements um, for about 20 days or so. With other things though like cucumbers and summer squashes, um, the stage that we eat them at is not the stage that we need to harvest them at. Cucumbers we're going to need to get really really big and they're going to get a little bit soft um, and a little discolored and not fun to eat looking. <laughs> um, the Summer squashes, we're gonna let them get big till they look like winter squashes. When they're all the way mature, you're, uh, the, they'll be hard on the outside so that you can't scratch them with your fingernail. That's kind of the rule of thumb with squash. Also important to know is that once, um, once these plants have fruit that is setting to seed, they're gonna stop producing other new flowers as much. If anyone has ever saved summer squash seed, it can be really frustrating because it means you don't really get to eat any more zucchini because it's just growing one giant <laughs> zucchini um, on your plant. So you might want to have some other plants if you want to continue to eat throughout the season um, once you know which ones have started to set fruit. So it's, it's also a good idea to do your, your pollinating earlier on because you don't want to be waiting till the end and have those be the reject flowers that your plant has decided it doesn't need anymore. So then in terms of processing, pretty simple with the things like the squashes and the melons because you pretty much just crack it open, clean out your seeds. Seeds, you want to probably rinse them off a little bit to get that gunk off of them. But then it's just a simple, straightforward drying and storage. Cucumbers, um, you can do a fermentation process similar to tomatoes since they are kind of in that liquidy, gelatinous casing. Um, so if you've ever done tomatoes before, it's the same process. You just scoop out those seeds, mix them with just a little bit of water, um, and you leave that to ferment not inside your house anywhere and preferably somewhere um, away from smelling distance because um, it gets a little bit funky. But at that point, then you'll just rinse those off and you'll know when they're ready because they'll get a nice crusty, gross mold layer on the top. Um, and then those are ready to go. Um, so that's it. That's my 15 minute um, rendition on cucurbits and how to save seed. Um.